We, the deaf, do not want to hear the noise of their world. In our deaf world, we find our peace and our power. If you cannot understand this, then go. Deaf power, deaf power, deaf power. Daddy loves you. Daddy loves you. <laughs> Daddy. Yes, here. That was a boy who was previously deaf hearing for the first time. You probably see this as one of the most wonderful moments of this little boy's life, but not if you're TEDx, and seemingly not if you're a student at Queen Margaret University at Edinburgh. Here we have a lady named Megan Dixon talking about deaf gain. And deaf gain aims to challenge and redefine what it is that we know about deafness, about human diversity, um, and about um, being different, I guess, in our world. This idea of deaf gain um, was first su suggested um, by um, a guy named Aaron Williamson. Aaron Williamson is a performance artist um, who began to lose his hearing at a young age. And Aaron's parents did what any typical person um, would do whenever the body undergoes rapid change, and they sought medical help. Okay, that sounds reasonable. I think it would be weird if Aaron Williams' parents didn't seek medical help. After years of multiple visits um, to doctors and to audiologists, Aaron came to a realization and he asked this question. Why had all the doctors told me that I was losing my hearing and none of them had told me that I was gaining my deafness? Probably because he was losing his hearing. Maybe they phrased it that way because that's exactly what was happening. He was able to hear before and was losing the ability to do so. How else would you expect a doctor to talk to a patient looking to regain their ability to hear again? I just want you to think about that for a couple of seconds. I have, and it sounds absurd to even ask the question. If Aaron Williamson eventually gave up seeking treatment, fine, but that doesn't retroactively make his doctors stupid for not talking about his condition as a positive thing. Why did you do it? Why did I give a human being the power of hearing? You can ask God the same question and give you the same answer. Deaf British Sign Language, Sign Language users have a common experience of life, and this manifests itself in deaf culture. Deaf culture incorporates um, art, history, value, beliefs, but it's also an attitude. Deaf people are extremely proud to be deaf and extremely proud um, of their culture. I bet some deaf people have told you that, Megan Dixon. I suppose it's just coincidence that all those proud deaf people are only deaf because of some medical problem. It must be happenstance that no hearing person becomes deaf voluntarily. It's that or they're lying to themselves and they're lying to you. They must repeat that lie to themselves every second of every day. But the fact that you believe them tells me you're as gullible as they are self-deluded. However... Deafness can also um, be seen as, as a severe loss to the majority um, hearing people surrounding, surrounding deaf people. You mean the majority of hearing people like you, Megan Dixon? See, you're implicitly saying that this notion is false. Losing your hearing is a gain, supposedly, not a major loss. But if it's not a major loss, why do you retain your ability to hear? Why not undergo surgery to remove the organs in your ears so as to become a part of this proud culture? But I want to challenge this today. You do? Okay, well, and here's my suggestion. How about you announce that you're about to undergo surgery to become deaf voluntarily? That would definitely challenge me. If being deaf is something to be proud of, then imagine how much pride you could have that you didn't wait for some medical problem to give it to you. You went and got it yourself. You could wear that as a mark of pride. It would, you'd be different from all the other deaf people. So why not do it? It's not a severe loss, is it? I want you to take into consideration a deaf child who is born into a deaf family. They are brought up surrounded by sign language um, and therefore they naturally acquire this language and that's how they fully express themselves without any barriers. Just think about that for a moment. Do you think this deaf child experiences any sense of loss within that situation? 
Yes! That child is going to interact with other people eventually. Even if he can't hear, he can still see the effects of sound on the people who can hear around him. He'll be able to see the happiness and glee people experience when they hear a song they love and how they'll sing along to it, jam to it, dance to it. Meanwhile, he's just there, knowing they're reacting to something, but he can't partake. He can't enjoy it with them because he can't hear. You don't think he won't feel left out? Kids who can hear still feel left out if they can't engage with others socially. How much more so would a child who can't even hear what's going on? Do you think this deaf child experiences any sense of loss within that situation? What if he can experience a sense of loss? Is he just some silly, stupid kid who doesn't know how good he has it, Megan Dixon? Or worse yet, what if two deaf parents have a hearing child? Should they have hoped that they would get a deaf child so he wouldn't experience a sense of loss? This is really funny. I mean, all parents ever pray for when they have a child is that it be healthy. And we can't have a child because God might give us a healthy one. Maybe, maybe we should just pray to God and ask him for a blind baby so we can take care of it and not have to worry about it. Yeah, why not pray for a blind child? Or a deaf child, as long as the parents are blind, or a deaf child, as long as both the parents are deaf, why not pray for that, Megan Dixon? There's no sense of loss, so that makes it okay, right? You see, hearing people um, have controlled the construction of knowledge about deafness and what it is um, to be deaf. And unfortunately, because of this, um, deaf people have been given some sort of secondary status where they are seen as different. Well, according to you, they are different. You just got done telling me that deaf people have their own attitude and their own culture. Why wouldn't I see them as different? You're the one telling me that they are. You've convicted yourself, Megan Dixon. You're the villain of your own speech, a hearing person who made deaf people out to be different. Guilty as charged. And therefore, less valuable. Less valuable in what sense? A strictly utilitarian sense? If that's what you mean, then yeah, there are plenty of functions that would be better fulfilled by a hearing person. For example, I wouldn't hire a deaf person over a hearing person to babysit my children. If I had to pick between two applicants and each are just as qualified to do the job except one can hear and the other can't, I'd hire the one who can. I want her to be able to hear what my children are doing so she can better watch out for them. It's not because of bigotry that I see a deaf babysitter as less valuable. I see her as less valuable because she is less valuable. She's not a second-class citizen, and I refuse to accept that I must be treating her as a second-class citizen because I'm not willing to leave my child in her care. Medical organizations have sought to restore deaf people to um, the status of hearing and speaking members of society through cure and compensation. Yeah, so is that a bad thing? I guess it must be. It must be, it just must be bigotry that we look for ways to help deaf people hear again. Like this teenage girl, for instance. I'll turn it up as we talk, okay? Okay. Ready? Yeah. Okay. Baby girl. Can't talk. you. What do you think? I like it. (laughs) Yeah, how dare her mom treat her child's condition with cure and compensation like that. If she knew better, she would know Amanda wasn't losing her hearing. She was gaining her deafness. Why not let her stay the way she was, Megan Dixon? The thing is, I bet if you were in that room with her, you'd start crying tears of joy along with them. This is a miracle, but it's a miracle of technology that only hearing people could provide her. If anything you said in this talk makes any sense, then this is not a happy occasion. Amanda is a victim of bigotry. Not only does this um, 
does this uh, privilege one way of being over another, but it actively seeks to impose a preference being hearing and oppresses another being deaf. I like it. <laughs> Yeah. It's a lot better than I thought it was going to be. <laughs> Good, I'm glad. But it actively seeks to impose a preference being hearing and oppresses another being deaf. I guess we're going to have to blame the victim now because Amanda isn't just being oppressed, she's become the oppressor now, oppressing the deaf state of being by valuing her hearing over deafness. How dare she? So I just want to think about um, you and your lives, I guess, and um, if you think that at any point you've come across a deaf person and had these kind of, um, they're known as oddest attitudes, so oddism, um, which is oppression of deaf people. Oh, you mean that same oppression of deaf people that led to the invention of implants so that deaf people can hear again? That's what's so stupid about this whole talk. She's dead serious. She thinks that kind of thing is literal oppression. This is where um, my research comes into place and my PhD, which I'm studying here at Queen Margaret University. Dear God Almighty, this woman is working on her PhD? She's not even as smart as a 13-year-old. What the heck is she going to do when she gets a PhD? And what is Queen Margaret University at Edinburgh doing by rewarding her for spouting this kind of nonsense? But I would just like to point out a couple of things that I've learned from a very limited time of being in deaf spaces and deaf contexts. Wait, so you've had a very limited amount of time to even study this subject firsthand, yet here you are on stage giving a TEDx talk, as though you've learned enough that you're fit to teach others how oppressive they don't know they are. Holy cow! The first thing is that deaf people, um, whenever they think of being deaf, it, they don't feel a sense um, of loss. Garbage. Don't tell me that. I've seen too many videos of people gaining the ability to hear. That little boy and then that little girl. Especially that little girl who lost her hearing and then got it back. She's overjoyed. Don't tell me that in their state of hopelessness that they don't feel a sense of loss. That's a lie. But it's rather just a distinct way of being in the world. Yeah, a way of being that sucks. Think about this for a second. You've got a man who can hear and then he loses his hearing. Then he can't hear his wife singing in the kitchen. Or, dare I say it, he can't hear her voice during intimacy. Oh, jeez. Bet you didn't think about that, huh? Yeah, it's kind of awkward, but it goes right to the heart of the matter. That's the price a former hearing person would have to pay. And that's just one tragic loss that comes with that distinct way of being. I can never fully cross the border into that world. I will never know what it is to be a deaf child. Irrelevant. And what's more, I know that you know that's irrelevant, Megan Dixon. Just a few minutes ago, you rhetorically implied that a deaf child born into a deaf family won't experience any sense of loss at not being able to hear. Who are you to say such a thing if you'll never know what it's like to be a deaf child? Let's be honest here. You're on that stage because you don't care if you've never been deaf. You still think you're fit to speak about this authoritatively, but you're pretending to be humble by declaring that you'll never know as if that mattered to you. But you haven't fooled me. Lastly, I just want to tell you a story. This is a story about Martha's Vineyard. This is a true story about an island off the coast of Massachusetts. Early settlers on Martha's Vineyard, um, a lot of them, carried a gene which caused deafness. Deafness became so prevalent on the island that um, the inhabitants developed their own unique sign language. This sign language was not only used by hearing, or by deaf, sorry, members of the island, but also the hearing. Just think about that for a moment. Everyone was able to communicate with one another without any barriers being put in place. You mean besides the difficulty of the hearing people needing to learn sign language, right? You know who else can communicate without barriers? Hearing people who can speak clearly to each other who don't need to learn a whole new language. I don't know about you, but one sounds a lot more barrier-free than the other. This meant that deaf people were incorporated into every part of the island-like community life. 
They owned farms, they ran businesses, and um, they sat in local councils and governments. Well, well, props to the hearing people then. I don't know if you noticed or not, but you just painted hearing people as the good guys. Thanks to their learning sign language... This meant that deaf people were incorporated into every part of the island like, like community life. It looks like these deaf people were unable to participate in all acts of life without the cooperation of the hearing people first. I don't know about you, but I wouldn't be proud of that if I were deaf. That my ability to go places in life hinges upon other people sacrificing their convenience to learn a language they don't need to learn. So much for the pride of deaf culture. That sounds, that sounds humiliating. Not only that, but hearing people, um, I guess, saw the benefits of knowing a sign language as well. So farmers could communicate with each other across fields. Okay, but keep in mind what that entails. That assumes that whomever a farmer is signing to can see him. This method of communication only works if whomever he's working with can see his hand movements. If the other farmer is nearsighted, or worse yet, they're working at night or early morning, sign language isn't going to work across a field. All you've pointed out is that in highly specific situations where weather conditions are right and you're standing far apart but you can still see each other and both farmers have good eyesight and they've taken the time and trouble to learn sign language, then knowing sign language can be a handy skill. But that sounds a lot less handy as it sounds tedious. If you're not deaf, you can simply call to them or move closer to them. And with cell phones and walkie-talkies, it becomes even more inconvenient to learn sign language when you can just talk and listen to each other, which is what hearing people can do and deaf people can't. If both persons are able to hear each other, then learning sign language is unhelpful and unnecessary. Women could gossip and chit-chat um, through, win- through shop windows without having to interrupt their daily life. <laughs> Okay, I wouldn't call that a good thing, but leaving that aside, how would that not interrupt their daily life? Whatever they were doing in their shop, they would have to put on hold because they would need their hands to sign to the other lady, and the other lady would have to focus her gaze on you to know what you were communicating. That sounds like the very definition of interrupting your daily life. Now, on the other hand, if you can hear and talk, then you can use your hands to continue working while chatting up a friend or a coworker. You don't even have to stop and stare at each other to talk back and forth. Two deaf people, they can't do that. They'd have to at least be staring in each other's directions at the same time. And at least one of them, whomever is signing at the time, she would have to stop whatever she was doing if she hadn't already. If anything, this proves that hearing people have an advantage over deaf people. Hearing people can talk without interrupting their daily life, whereas deaf people can't. I mean, did you even consider this, Megan? It really looks like it didn't. The more you talk, the worse you make deafness out to be. Um... Martha's Vineyard um, meant that no one was oppressed, no one was discriminated against within that society. Yeah, the woman who just got done telling us how deaf people had an enhanced ability to gossip to each other is going to tell us that in a world like that, there would be no oppression and no one would be pushed to the margins. The sad thing is, I don't think she said that accidentally. I think she really believes that. And I guess my message for you today um, is that Martha's Vineyard beautifully um, illustrates the kind of world that I dream of. And earlier it was mentioned that for something to become a reality, we need to dream of it first. So I want to challenge you um, to dream of that kind of world also. A world where no one is oppressed and no one is pushed to the margins. Thank you. Megan Dixon, if protesting against deaf people getting treated for their deafness is your means of achieving utopia... You're a psychopath. Or a sociopath, whatever the word is. But you know what? You don't scare me as much as Queen Margaret University. They're the ones enabling you and encouraging you to say the things you're saying. It's nothing short of brainwashing. It's no different from some bizarre religious cult that preaches against using modern medicine. And as for TEDx, well, they're only too happy to participate. Good job, TEDx. I Gosh, what a shame. What an absolute shame. I, I, I just refuse to believe that you are happy, genuinely happy, having lost your eyesight. It's the best thing that ever happened to me. Oh, okay, fine. Well, then why don't we get some earplugs and some nose plugs, and then you can just cut yourself off completely from the world. Yeah. Or maybe we could arrange to have you put into a coma. Well, let's try the earplug thing first. 
house made it through that entire differential without mocking our patient for not having a cochlear implant. The patient doesn't want an implant because he's comfortable with who he is. It's admirable. He's deaf. It's not an identity, it's a disability. It's also a culture. The deaf have their own schools, their own language. Her son didn't want the implant. He still doesn't want it. After having time to adjust, I'll take it out. I'll blind him, too, if he wants to experience that culture. Still no spiking. Going to 20. Anything I can simulate with a $3 pair of earplugs is not a culture. The links to Megan Dixon's full TEDx talk will be in the description below, along with citations for all the excerpts of TV shows if you're wondering where I got them. I just have one last thing to ask before I go. Why does the description for her video say that Megan Dixon is passionate about the taken-for-granted nature of hearing? I thought she spent this whole talk saying hearing wasn't a big deal. I don't know. I'll let you guys figure it out in the comment section below. Thanks for watching, like, and subscribe, and I can't wait to see you again on the Prince Asbel channel.